Good afternoon. My name is Farah Kilidar, and I'm the CEO of the World Affairs Council. And to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Richard Sandel, senior fellow at the Milken Institute, chairman and CEO of Environmental Financial Products LLC, lecturer in law and economics at the University of Chicago. A financial innovator known as the father of financial futures, Sandor has been the, at the epicenter of environmental and financial markets for a number of decades now. He founded the climate exchange family of companies, including the Chicago Climate Exchange, the world's first and North America's only voluntary, legally binding greenhouse gas cap and trade system. The Chicago Futures Exchange, the European Climate Exchange, as well as a number of global affiliates. Time Magazine honored Richard as one of its heroes of the environment in 2007 and as, its, as one of its heroes for the planet in 2002. I'm not really sure what the difference is, but he's a hero basically. And both of uh, those honors were awarded for his work as father of carbon trading. Please join me in welcoming Richard Sandor. Thank you uh, very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it sounds like you have some uh, very exciting events uh, coming up. Uh, so being here is quite an honor, although I feel like a pair of brown shoes at a formal event. Uh, I want to share with you today <coughs> a broad overview and a theory of wealth creation. If we take a look at wealth creation for the last 400 years, it seems to follow a very simple pattern. There's a structural change, there's a commoditization and a standardization that occurs, that's followed by the development of evidences of ownership, then trading, then exchanges, then derivatives. And if you go back to the, the structural change in the 16th century, the opening up and the development and the invention of the Dutch East India Company, same pattern. If you look at wheat trading, it was the population growth in the East and Chicago exporting wheat to Crimea in 1853. If you follow that with the Osaka rice trading, it all seems to fall into that pattern. A big structural change, commoditization, evidences of ownership because you don't trade commodities you trade evidences of ownership. And that's where wealth creation has come in. And that also occurred very recently, hard to believe for all of us who were around, that in fact there was no long-term government debt in the mid-70s in the United States. Today, in 18, 1982, when interest rate futures were in their early days, the total supply of issuance of 10-year notes, total supply was 23 billion roughly. We issued 24 billion a month today. What happened, inflation, wars, deficits, all were the structural change that provided the background. What about environmental markets? Where, where do these sorts of things fit in? Because they're a very different kind of market. They are created. And they are created basically by 
use rights, the right to use a commodity like water, a limitation on the use, or in fact a right to emit only a certain amount that has occurred. If we take a look at wealth creation over a period of time, from 45 to 70, it was manufacturing. The United States emerged as the critical power following the second war controlling two-thirds of world GDP. The 70s was an era of commodities. Here in Texas, two Arab oil embargoes, a shortage in the Chinese crops, the Russian crops, U.S. failure, ultimately huge amounts of wealth created from commodities. The 80s was the commoditization in new financial instruments. Things like financial futures, banks, asset liability management, destroyed 6,000 SNLs, re-emerged with the system. Ultimately, we saw wealth creation with new financial instruments, something pejoratively called junk bonds. And what do they do? They finance crazy people like Ted Turner, who had an idea that we'd have a global network. John Malone, that we'd have cable TV. Bill McGowan, that could be other than one company in telecommunications, starting MCI. Terry McGaw, starting the cell phone. All facilitated by innovation in financial instruments. The 90s has been yet another commoditization. And that commoditization basically arose from information. In 86, Microsoft went public. 90, Cisco went public. Mark Andreessen worked at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Came up with, ultimately, Mosaic, which came Netscape, and the web was born, and we had the commoditization of information. Now what are we doing? We're commoditizing social media. We're basically turning networks, and we're creating wealth that way. I want to put forth the hypothesis that wealth creation in the 21st century will be driven by the commoditization of air and water along with these technological trends, that there simply is no substitute for these commodities. They are scarce. There are no substitutes for them. And they are the future, particularly for all of the students that, that are here. The 21st century is dealing with a planet whose GDP continues to grow in spite of the worldwide recession. Population expands. And it is the two commodities that there's only finite supply of. Let me share with you a, a couple of developments. Um, and the first thing that we need to do before sharing is to talk about cap and trade and its very simple basics. The cap refers to putting a limitation on the amount of pollution you can put into the air or water or the amount of water that you can draw down from aquifers, surface water, etc. So you have a cap. The trade comes in because some people might go over that cap and some people might go under that cap. So let's assume we have two utilities. One of them's Farra Power and the other is Richard Utility. And Richard Utility is not very good at reducing his emissions, but Farra Power really knows how to do it. And so she drives the innovation and reduction of pollution far below her cap. 
Richard Utility's not very good, so he buys her reduction. It doesn't matter if we've systemically reduced, for example, by 10%, and Fowler, Farrah Power does 20 and I do zero, it's not relevant, or we both do 10, the same social outcome occurs. So we cap the emissions and then we allow people to go over and under because Farrah Power can easily, in a case of let's say SO2, can modify her boilers, bring in Powder River coal from Wyoming, and reduce sulfur emissions. Richard Utility has got only two acres. I can't install a technology that would clean the flue gas, and so she has a comparative advantage, and it is simply the gains from trade which allow this. Let me talk about, in the 1980s, the United States was ravaged by acid rain. Most of you don't remember, but people made movies like Michael Douglas called Black Rain. It was going to destroy the Northeast. It was going to kill all the trees and recreational areas. And so, actually, out of this state, the first George Bush supported a cap-and-trade program to reduce acid rain. It was novel. The opponent said it wouldn't work. The prices would be hot, too high. It would destroy U.S. competitiveness internationally, a topic of interest, and it wouldn't work. Think about the current arguments about global warming and cap and trade in that concept, the same sorts of arguments. Well, what happened? In fact, all of the forecasts were from three to $900 a ton, and it traded, a, and the marginal cost of building the technology to take the sulfur out of flue gas, which comes out when you burn coal, was $600 a ton. In fact, prices were $100, even got as low as $60 for the first 10 years. In fact, if you look at the map, we reduced, we reduced emissions from coal from 18 million to three and a half million today. The cost to the U.S. economy, unlike what the doomsayers said, is one to three billion, and the gains from the reduction of health care costs are $123 billion a year. A program that cost one to three billion and threw off 123 billion. And as a simple student of economics, I think the GDP is a lot higher if you take 123 billion of benefits and a billion or two billion in costs. This SO2 experience also resulted in, according to reports published on the EPA website, about 35,000 lives a year being saved. So the effects have been enormous. The program worked because the benefits of trading so exceeded the costs of setting up the program. When you develop a market, you basically have to take a look at, at the costs, and the costs are legislative, they're regulatory, they're the cost of establishing an exchange, and they are the design elements of a specific type of contract. How do you homogenize water or SO2 or CO2, et cetera. Um, and basically, everybody told us this was a dumb idea. Nobody would join and, and enter into a commercial contract to reduce emissions by 6% because there was no law. 
In spite of that, we ended up with the biggest coal burning utility, American Electric Power, Alliant, Reliant, Ford, United Technology, Safeway, Honeywell, Intel, Bank of America, waste management, and it all worked. In fact, that program worked and uh, proved the, the concept and the members cut a size of emissions of what France did. In the European Union, they instituted a cap and trade on CO2. That program was supposed to reduce emissions by 8% and reduce them by 14%. So while there's not much dialogue in the United States about cap and trade, this map really says it all. And if you take a look at what we're witnessing today, in the United States, two regional programs, one in the Northeast called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, one in California, and for good or bad, Socially, in, environmentally, and technological, California is a pace setter. And one has to watch it that, and watch it carefully, because it may establish a national trend. If you take a look in Europe, it's alive and well. And if you look at China, China has seven separate cap and trade programs. And as a matter of fact, if you look at this map, there's a peculiar inference that can be made. Financial inventive activity is definitely and distinctly and directly proportional to the distance from Washington, D.C. <laughs> the further you go, the more reliance on marketplaces and the more belief, including the People's Republic of China, that financial incentives change behavior and that markets are inherently a powerful way to deal with pollution. It's a very odd message. And very often, between China and California, <coughs> watch those areas carefully. I want to go into a couple of other things, and then we'll open up to questions, because then I won't be technology bound, and you won't see somebody fumbling on stage for, for, for griping with this. Water. What better place to talk about water shortages than Texas today? All of the compacts are being stressed. The entire western half of the United States. We use 150 gallons a day. The Europeans use 75 per capita and China uses 25 for hydration and hygiene all you really need is 25 to 30 gallons a day. That excess drives irrationality. If you go to New Mexico and you take an acre foot of water, 650 acres, foot high, it produces $250,000 worth of alfalfa. That same amount of water creates 5,000 jobs at Intel's chip factory in Albuquerque, yet the farmer cannot trade with Intel. It's phenomenal when you think of those dislocations. Farmers in Pennsylvania overapply fertilizers and you get too much nitrogen. It flows into the rivers, has to be treated by wastewater treatment plants, and then goes down into the Chesapeake Bay and kills crabs. Real simple allowance. 
let the wastewater put a trading system in, which the state of Pennsylvania has done, and all of a sudden, the farmers can be paid to organically farm less nitrogen, the wastewater people can have less, and the fishermen's catch is increased. No different than David Ricardo said, the gains from trade. Let people specialize and work there. How about Texas water? In New South Wales and Australia, they put in a cap and trade program. They succeeded beyond everybody's doubt and increased the GDP of one province, 377 million, and they avoided drought. It was just because price put conservation in, the, in place. So if they can in New South Wales, as one province of a small country, add 380 million, close to 400 million to their GDP, what could an intelligent cap and trade program in Texas add to the state GDP? I don't care about golf courses in the desert. I just would like people to pay for the water they use. I don't care if you want to take a two hour recreational shower. You ought to pay for it. Beyond your human physical needs, incentives and wealth creation are there. I want to finish up in uh, two observations, and I don't know if I can use this. We're back to this, so I'll, I'll, I'll just simply go forward. Back again? No, uh, go forward. forward in. This. Is that up? Uh -huh. So take a look at this. It takes 100 gallons of water to produce a pound of corn, 500 for a pound of chicken, and every time you eat a piece of steak of one pound, you consume 1,800 gallons of water. We, in effect, have water markets internationally. We don't call them that. We call them grain markets because there's virtual water embedded in it. And think of a drought-ridden country that did get its act together, like Australia, that recognized you feed cattle in the desert, that's fine, it's noble, but you've got to conserve water and you need prices. All right, what have I talked about here? What's, the, what's the, the magic and what's the conclusion? Two observations about financial markets, and we talked about opportunity, Don and I did it at lunch. Where's the next problem? The U.S. insurance industry has 500 billion to 600 billion in capital. There's another 80 billion of companies that insure the insurance companies. They're called reinsurers. The biggest one happens to be owned by a man by the name of Warren Buffett. He is withdrawn from the catastrophe few writing business now. Catastrophe bonds offer 4% or 5% in a yield hungry world. The smartest investor, according to many people, now doesn't want to write catastrophe insurance. What would have happened if Sandy would have made a right turn in New Jersey and hit New York? Theoretically, and it's important here in Texas, one event could take out the entire capital of the insurance industry. That's what weather, climate, and markets can do. What do we learn from all of this? Whether it's sulfur dioxide or whether it's carbon, and I, and I happen to believe that it's an important issue, climate change, and I believe markets can make it 
or reduce its, its bad effects in a very cost-effective way. And I don't think that th this is a debate about climate deniers and climate. I look at it as a trader. And I look at it like buying health insurance. If I can buy it cheap enough, I'm not going to die tomorrow, hopefully. And I know that I live today, so I just made a bad bet by having my kids and grandkids all insured. Right? That's a bad bet. But I basically believe the context of that debate should be what are the costs of doing something about it and what are the risks of not doing something about it? It is not this thing is or, or what not. SO2, everybody screamed it would kill the utilities. All I know is that GE figured out a way to make a lot of money from building scrubbers. A lot of people made money. And the point of this talk is that doing good and doing well are not contradictory. Okay, much of the environmental movement would like to punish the polluters as opposed to solve the problem. I say if you want to punish the polluters, there's a place on Sunday that you can go and exercise <laughs> your right, okay? But if you want to do business and solve a social problem, there's nothing wrong with people making money and doing well. Whether it's pharmacy, whether it's food, whether it's cattle ranching, they should not be viewed out of a different lens. The lessons are simple. If you would have gotten short every single environmental commodity from the day the market opened, you would have won. Typically, price changes behavior more than anybody thinks it does. You could have sold SO2 allowance, European carbon, water, it just really doesn't matter because people don't understand the potency of price in changing behavior. So what have I said? I said, we started out talking about markets go through seven stages and we set the, the grounds that the seven stages are ripe for air and water. We further said, if we look at wealth creation, we can separate it into decades and epochs. And we further said that air and water, if they follow the, the ways and modes of history, could become the biggest commodities of the 21st century. We have ample evidence from acid rain to carbon to water from Australia to China, where markets are taking over the job. We have to, in the United States, focus on the environmental goods and the cost of achieving them. It's important to me. It's also important to you, to your children, and to your grandchildren. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Richard. As uh, we wait for questions to be written, I have a couple of questions for you. Obviously, water is a big issue, uh, one that is close to your mind. A few weeks ago, we had a speaker uh, talk to us about the use of water resources as uh, a means of war. Uh, they were, he was actually war. He was looking at the Middle East and the building of dams, uh, Turkey, uh, keeping a lot of the water to, from flowing down to Iraq and so on and so forth. And it's envisaged that water resources are really going to be the, one of the primary um, causes of conflicts. So do you see the, um, as you call it, the utilization of water as a possible solution for something like that? And if so, uh, how would it be done? How is it possible? Uh, so I had a visit uh, with the Holy Land Water Authority with a group of Arabs and Israelis 
who in effect are trading water now. They just did a deal for a pipeline and desalinization swap of technology to access to the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee. If you look at that in recent times, it's almost a trade. These are very sober people in the Middle East. The one thing they agree upon is that markets can be a catalyst for peace and not war. Make no mistake about it, I don't believe that, that Tibet is about religion. I've been to China 30 times in the last seven, eight years or something. It's about water. It's the Himalayas and the rivers that flow through China, and it's the battle between China and India. There's desertification. There's only three places in the world that are long water. The eastern half of the United States, and let's call it the US and Canada, one continent, South America two, Europe the third. Everybody else is short. China's short, India's short. We're desertifying all of, of the northern part of Africa. You think there are social problems now with migration into the EU what happens if we have major droughts and you get 500 million people on the march? I'm very optimistic. I've spoken to Indians about it. I've spoken to Chinese about it. I've spoken to Israelis about it. And I've spoken to Arabs about it. They all understand that if you open it up to a capitalist type system, you price water waste and inefficiency, you'll get infrastructure built, you'll get desalinization. To this day back there, Tel Aviv, well, it's, let's start with Singapore, it recycles 97% of the water it uses. 97%. One interesting business point, Don, to mention to you. So they took gray water, and the idea was from toilet to tap, which everybody gets repugnant and horrified by the notion that you can take gray water, okay, and then drink it. So they were having a big tough time with the Singaporeans on selling them to do this. Being a very inventive country, so instead of it distributing for, it for no cost, they in fact became the low cost provider of distilled water and built their chip business by selling this water that's purer than tap water to the technology sector and they turned it into a plus. There's no limit to the creativity. Tel Aviv is 75% recycled. Those are two places that are deserts, and they don't use water. We have a great question from Memorial High. Um, in your opinion, why is the US so far behind in implementing these types of cap and trade programs? And what can we do as students to help the US progress in this area? Uh, I need to choose my words carefully. Uh, <laughs> Uh, having spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. Um, I think that, that we, we're going through a time of paralysis in the legislative system. And I, I don't think the environment is any different than everything else that, that you've seen. I get more acceptance for my ideas in any communist country than I do in Washington, D.C. Um, that China, you know, uh, uh, or the biggest communist country, um, you find, I think, a, uh, rather than working together, people are just coming at it from two different sides. They're not debating the issue. They did with sulfur dioxide. 
but somehow in the last 16 years, it's not talking. That's coupled with an increasing attitude that wealth creation, okay, is not good because of wealth inequality. As a student of economics, there are two issues in economics. One is production. How do you make the pie as large as possible? And the other is distribution. And there are a lot of people who now believe we don't care about the production side. We don't want efficiencies from companies like Schlumberger. We're more concerned about distribution of resources rather than maximizing GDP. And I think we need to recognize there are two different issues. We can and should get rid of the income inequality that's caused by lack of education, lack of availability of, of human capital. We need to just bring up the human capital and not destroy the productive resources and redistribute them because sooner or later there's nothing left. So taking that question further, where do you see the U.S. going in the next 10 years vis-a-vis -vis carbon, re carbon renewable energy or even the water there? I think it's all in the hands of the states. I'm, I'm not bearish. Quite to the contrary, I'm bullish. I think that we will see a price of carbon California and the People's Republic of China will demonstrate the viability of dealing with climate change through markets. And we are a federal republic. It happened with seat belts. It starts with local standards. You go to national later. Not only in the environment, it happened in the grain markets. The Midwest developed grain standards. The USDA adopted those. So proof of concept will be done at the state level, not the federal level. And the United States will invent its way around all of these issues because of our entrepreneurship and because of the fact we're a federal republic. So look to the states. Look to China. One little event, maybe doesn't sound very important. I assume everybody here knows that the Chinese currency is not convertible. Right? You can't convert it into dollars. Except in a very, and it, it goes back to page 23 in the right hand corner of the Financial Times, there's one commodity that you can convert in and out of RMB, and that's carbon in Shenzhen. Hard to believe, but true. You can actually trade and buy RMBs and sell. You can't do it with washing machines. You can't do it with cars. You can't do it with drilling equipment. You can't do it for any commodity except carbon. That says to me that's a very interesting signal. And I think the, the truth is never or rarely on the front pages. It's found in the want ads and in the second and third sections. By the time it gets to the front page, it's like the Sports Illustrated or the Time Magazine. That's the end. It's not the beginning. Don't forget the obituaries as well. Yes. <laughs> so, looking at the juxtaposition between the U.S. and China, would you say China is pretty much set, going to be setting the stage for the rest of the globe? I think the surprise. We have uh, meetings in Paris um, in December for the United Nations framework, what they call it's the Kyoto Treaty, without getting into acronyms. Um, and that Kyoto Treaty is set to be renewed after 2020. I think the U.S. will hammer away at command and control, which is much less efficient, and pose regulation after regulation after regulation. 
on U.S. industry. I think California will demonstrate that is not the most efficient way. We'll do it because we're so good, but we'll do it at costs we should never have to bear. And I think that California has now entered into a treaty with Montreal. So we now have an international treaty with Quebec and California. All we need is one or two states to join. And I've been arguing to, to the people in California, they just ought to open it up to any American company that wants to comply. And they can instantaneously become the US system. So I'm optimistic. I, th I think we're already seeing the $100 in oil set in place set in place inventive activity that's not going to stop, including fracking, including additional supplies, et cetera. I, well, I think that, that there is a, still a strong future for fossil fuels. Trends don't end, and Sheikh Yamani said the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, <laughs> and the Oil Age won't end with no oil. But it takes longer, in my experience as a financial inventor, before one phase begins and another phase ends. So I'm quite optimistic about energy and energy efficiency. We'll get by it, but we'll do it after, as Winston Churchill said, we do the right thing after exhausting every other possibility. So what kind of government regulations are required to set these new commodity uh, markets and who will set them up? What, uh, I'll finish with the last thing. Uh, if we take a look at what's happening, you said about Washington, what's the problem? We had a problem with regard to banking results. Okay, I teach at the University of Chicago. The legislation Dodd-Frank to deal with the banking crisis is 2,300 pages. 2,300 pages. That is longer than the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the Koran combined. So if you can govern the behavior of three major religions in the world and you can write bank capital requirements in 10 pages, there's something systemically wrong. If, and the, the swaps which energy folks are involved with, the way to hedge, is 865 pages. Now I teach at the University of Chicago, if one of my students handed in a, a definition of a swap that was more than one page, I would strongly suggest that perhaps economics and finance would not be their chosen field of endeavor. You can write the entire SO2 program is contained in 15 pages. The bill's hundreds, but the trading part of it is 15. All I'm saying is keep it simple, okay? But legislation is not made simply. You could argue that the three religions haven't been well governed as evidenced by the turmoil. So the three religions have not been well governed, evidenced by the turmoil around the world. So perhaps they did need more. Uh, <laughs> they needed lawyers on it. Maybe, maybe they need lawyers. I'm not sure of that with all due respect, Susan, uh, uh, and teaching law and economics. Uh, look, we economists call this rents, and there's a lot of money paid out in this country to gatekeepers and rent seekers. You know, this is the great American barbecue as a piece of legislation Okay, the joke in Chicago, and sometimes we say it, the city logo ought to say, U mia est, which is essentially, where's mine? Okay, that's the, the logo. And you get a piece of legislation 
everybody figures, how do I get my hands in it to carve out my niche? So in the end, you've got, in Dodd-Frank, you had 5,000 lobbyists, okay? 10 lobbyists, and the same with the Obamacare, 10 lobbyists for every elected representative. Washington is recession proof. Okay, it has beat the economic cycle. And, and it's not, and I'm not taking a shot at, at anybody. These are smart, well-meaning people. Systemically, it's broken. The rent seeking, the ability to get out subsidies or grants. Every time a bill comes, and rightfully so, there's some place to carve out a niche. And that takes us to our last question. You correctly say price, prices is a very strong behavior changer. Isn't it a hundred, it, wouldn't you say that a 100% revenue neutral carbon tax, or even better, a carbon free, carbon fee and dividend, would be a more efficient method? <laughs> You, you might say absolutely not. I, I don't think there could be any worse way to do it. I remember, you think back, people said, let's raise gasoline taxes. So what happened? Nothing happens. The consumer gets more. It doesn't change behavior. It went up to one, two, three, four dollars. It didn't work. Second is, once you put it in place and you don't set it right, you can't change it. You simply have to look at Washington and see what happens. The third, who gets the money from the tax? Okay, basically the last time it was thrown up was in the White House in 08, and they said the price that we need to change behavior is $20. Now you want the market determining or whatnot, and the people who authored that said $20 a ton in carbon. What they forgot to look at was the investor-owned utilities. And at $20 a ton, you would eliminate 100% of the profits of the utilities in the United States. And they said, that's the number you need. I prefer the market to do it, I think taxes, Will, will really be fantastic for the accountants and lawyers. Now there's companies that pay no taxes in America and there's companies that take 40%. I can't understand the psychopathy of those people who look at the at a IRS code that's 77,000 pages long and want to tax and expect the tax to change behavior you put corn out of line 50 cents and you get 20 million farmers planting less cotton and soybeans and all of a sudden corn doing it. You think if you gave them subsidies, which we do, the same supply response would occur? Plus the fact a tax is not why inventors behave. If they see and I'll finish it up with this, and it is an important metaphor. I'm still, we're still 10 minutes ahead. I had a guy call me at the Chicago uh, Climate Exchange. He was an M MIT professor. This is on message to the answer of taxes versus prices. He said, I have an idea. I said, what's that? And he said, well, I got this algae. I planted around a smokestack, it sucks out the, the carbon, it does photosynthesis. Can I sell the carbon in your exchange for a price of, of $4 a ton? I said, yeah, we would, as Susan and I do, we write protocols and we'll do one on algae and its transformation into a carbon absorber. I got the guy's business plan, God bless him, a physicist. And it showed something like this. Um, year one, reduce carbon, 
by 10 million tons times $4, I make $40 million. Year two, I reduce it by 50 million times $4, I make 200 million, and essentially, that was the business plan and showed reject. So, the guy eventually raised $10 million from one of our other investors, now turns algae into jet fuel. Now, do you think an accountant or a lawyer would have been able to sell GE or some other corporation on a way to reducing their tax bills, or this inventor would have not been able to or be inspired by a tax code? It just doesn't work. And it's as wrong-headed as you can get. Now, very legitimate, distinguished men and women whose path I cannot hope to ever follow in tell you it's theoretically the same. But I will tell you as an economist, you can choose any proposition you like if you can assume whatever you want. <laughs> it's real simple. You tell me black is white, yellow is green, war is peace, peace is war. Let me choose the assumptions. A very star smart real estate developer told me 40 years ago when I was thinking about mortgage-backed securities in a futures market, he said, I go into the banks and I say to him, I have a simple request. Just give me the freedom to set one or two things. You can set whatever you want. If you set the interest rate, I want to set the term to maturity. If you set the term to maturity, I want to set the rate. Because all you have to do is create or control one of those to become the superior bargainer in any kind of transaction. So, well, as a professional economist, you know, I do believe that, that there is a gap that needs to be filled. It's being filled by behavioral economics, but assumptions and conclusions are wonderful and they help you understand the world but I don't think public policy should be drawn from mathematical models that, whose assumption may not be correct. Now, most of all, I want to thank you, Farah, again, Schlumberger. Most important, all the young people who are taking time to come here, skate where the puck is going, not where it's been, okay? It's a Chicago metaphor. Look to world 30 years from now and what kind of world you want and look to where you think it's going and that will guide you in your decisions. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much.